Welcome back, everybody. We should be transitioning to a video clip, if I'm not mistaken. So just awaiting um, that video to start. Just bear with us. Fugaku has the power to pull the future closer, and its ability has been recognized as top in the world. But how was this ability achieved? In Japanese, the name Fugaku is another name for Mount Fuji, the shape of which includes both the mountain's summit, which suggests highest performance, and the mountain's broad base, which points to the computer's wide range of application. So what were the keys to reaching the summit? Fugaku uses cutting-edge semiconductor technology to realize high performance and energy savings. Thanks to the use of cutting-edge semiconductor technology, each CPU has as many as 52 cores integrated. In addition, the latest high-performance stacked memory with multiple memory chips is installed inside the package for the first time in a general-purpose CPU. The second key to reaching the summit of the mountain was Tofu Interconnect D. In fact, the structure is six-dimensional, with multi-dimensional connections like lengthwise, crosswise, depthwise, and even diagonally. So the work is divided and conducted in parallel. It carries this out on a very large scale. That's the major factor in increasing speed. And that's why we could reach the summit. We admired K Computer for working so hard, but after all, it was just dots from the Fugaku scale viewpoint. Fugaku's amazing. We get the impression it's really alive. The other nuance included in Fugaku's name is a broad base of use, like the broadly spread foot of Mount Fuji. Fugaku employs an instruction set developed by Arm Limited, so it will be possible to use the software stack developed for smartphones and embedded systems in the HPC field. We've often heard the feedback, it's so fast. But until now, we rarely heard anyone say a supercomputer was easy or simple to use. Fugaku places great importance on general purpose versatility. So in that sense, it's very revolutionary. In a way, I have a feeling this may be a new strategy for supercomputers. Searching for answers to complex problems that have no obvious solution and leading us to a new world. A supercomputer is a tool to pull the future closer. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Fujitsu Advanced Technology Symposium 2020. This is the final webcast of the day. We're glad you could join us. And um, hopefully those of you that have joined us from the last session were able to do so fairly seamlessly. As the video has suggested, our next keynote speaker, I'm very honored to introduce, Satoshi Matsuoka is currently director of the Riken Center for Compu Computational Science. Previously, he was a full professor at the Global Scientific Information and Computing, uh, Computing Center at Tokyo Institute of Technology and the director of the Real World Big Data Computing Open Innovation Laboratory, which was a joint effort by Japan's National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology and the city of Tokyo. He's former head of the world-renowned, uh, uh, sorry, uh, pronunciation of this. He's former head of the world-renowned Tsubame series of supercomputers, and he now leads various major supercomputing research projects in areas such as parallel algorithms and programming, resilience, green computing, and convergence of big data, AI with high performance computing. Uh, it's important to note that he's also been a major driving force behind the development of this next generation flagship supercomputer in Japan. Developed jointly with Fujitsu in June of this year, the supercomputer Fugaku won first place in four major rankings of supercomputer performance. And as I mentioned prior to the break, as of yesterday, um, Fugaku has uh, retained its number one spot across these four core performance areas. So quite an astounding accomplishment. Matsuoka-san received his PhD from the University of Tokyo in 1993, so it's now my pleasure to welcome Satoshi Matsuoka. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay. Um, very good. Okay, 
Okay, so uh, thank you very much again um, uh, for the uh, kind words and I'm uh, very honored to be here. You know, Fugaku is the uh, result of a project involving thousands of people, uh, including those from Mariken and also from Fujitsu, of course. And I'm more only honored to be you know, representing the efforts by each, each every individual that, you know, that has been poured into uh, making this system real and become uh, number one in the world. So in the next uh, 20 plus so minutes, I'll try to uh, describe really um, what Fugaku is, um, how, what we think about it, and what are its latest performance results, and how it's being used now, and uh, what we expect to see in the future. So um, uh, as the video had already indicated, uh, Fugaku, uh, we named it based on the fact that uh, it uh, represents our idealism of a supercomputer. Uh, that it has not only is fast, uh, has a very high peak, but also has a very broad base applicability. You know, that would be a much more general purpose thing than had been in the past to really impact the news, uh, usages uh, in broad IT, like those in AI and big data and clouds and so forth. And so, um, but this was a big challenge because to build something that's really fast and very broad at the same time is very difficult. And we're not talking about, you know, 10% you know, fast, 20% fast. When we did the analysis of all the applications that the scientists felt they could be running on in 10 years when the K computer was being was being completed, and, when, and everybody sort of asked for like two orders of magnitude performance bump. And then when we did the overall assessment of the possible machines we can build 10 years later, then um, it, it was pretty clear that there was just no way we could achieve that. So uh, basically we had to go and develop our own chip rather than buy something off the shelf. So we had to, uh, in, in fact, uh, from a uh, quantitative sense, we had to build something that would be three times faster than the processor of the time and three times more power efficient so it will not fit in our data center. And of course, it had to be general purpose. <coughs> um, and along the way, we also had to accommodate um, new usages of supercomputers, especially those in AI and also in big data. So we had to add those new features. So all of these combination, you know, ease of use, performance, new usage, resulted in a project that is, was essentially moon, was a moonshot. You know, just like when President Kennedy in the US said, you know, we shall go to the moon. And 10 years later, after the entire aeronautics industry of the United States, and in fact, the world, gathered together under a national US national project and said, what to the uh, man to the moon, which of course had initially seemed like you no know, um, you know, insurmountable goal. It was very similar for Gaku, you know, when we said we got to build something that will be exascale in 2020 and satisfying, well, and not just numerically, you know, in terms of let's say some of impact performance, but that would accelerate real applications across the board by two orders of magnitude. You know, that felt like uh, that was an insurmountable goal. So the entire Japanese community of HPC gathered together, not just Riken and Fujitsu, of course it was centered around uh, Riken and Fujitsu, but it was the entire community that got together and uh, ran the national project. And 10 years later, here we are. And um, uh, the aggregate performance of Gaku as a whole is about um, 20 million times faster than the smartphone. Um, as has been indicated, it runs the same program you know, because it runs the same R ARH64 instruction set plus the vector extensions. But the capability is 20 million, about 20 million smartphones or so, which is about the same number of smartphones that are sold in Japan over the course of the year. Or equivalently, just coincidentally, it's about the same number of servers sold in Japan over the course of the year. So if you had two or three Fugakus, you know, that would cover the entire IT portion in, in Japan. That's the magnitude of the machine we're talking about here. So, so that's Fugaku in a nutshell. And uh, like I said, uh, we actually started the project. We started uh, talking about it 10 years ago, around, uh, around, this, uh, around summer of 2010, when the K computer was being completed. 
and you know, uh, we had several steps in the project. And uh, uh, but after you know, ten years later, here we are. We have the machine, and we have not only achieved our performance goals, but also um, we are running real applications. We're still pre-production officially, but we're running some important applications that are only possible with machines like Fogaku, including fighting COVID-19, as I will describe to you later. Sorry, said that, so I'll skip. So um, so here's a chip, it's a 52 core, but uh, 48 available to the user. Uh, like had been mentioned, uh, it incorporates HPM2 for the first time as a general purpose CPU. HPM2 previously only had been used in more specialized processors like GPUs or some other, you know, much more specialized processors. It's the first time that's been compared with the CPU. And there are various reasons why this has not been done so in other CPUs. It's not trivial, uh, but uh, we achieved that. And it was a big risk. So, you know, uh, but, you know as a national project, uh, uh, you know, government money, taxpayer money is risk money. So basically we were able to take these risks to leapfrog uh, 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 the other vendors because, you know, if you're just if, if Fujitsu, let's say if Fujitsu were creating their own chip by, solely by themselves, they would not have been able to take these kinds of risks. But with the project, with the, with the risk money, entire Japanese community being involved, they could take advanced risk like that and innovate um, in a way that, that, was not, that would not have been possible. So um, internally, in order to drive uh, these high bandwidth memory, and the reason you need high bandwidth memory is because the, the, the chip the processor and the CPUs inside uh, have two facets of uh, performance or characteristics in terms of execution characteristics. So on one hand, you can consider this chip as a standard 48 core or 52 core, um, depending on how you look at it, uh, mini core ARM processor. So like I said, it boots Linux, uh, Red Hat right out of the box. It can run Windows, it can run PowerPoint, you know, it can do all kinds of things as a general purpose thing, and, and it runs pretty fast. It can run those as standard workloads pretty fast. So, you know, from one hand, it's a general purpose CPU uh, with lots of cores inside. On the other hand, um, it's also a streaming processor, very much like a GPU. It's not to say it has a GPU in it, but each of the cores behave in a streaming fashion, just like GPU cores do. So, so, so as to maximally uh, exploit the bandwidth afforded by the have bandwidth memory, and also transfer between the cores within within the chip, and also with the interconnect that's also embedded in the chip. So um, it has so the bandwidth in the chip, incoming bandwidth of the chip from the memory is a terabyte per second, which is almost the order of magnitude faster than comparable server processors that come out, uh, you know, that you know, companies like Intel, AMD, and other ARM vendors produce. And um, uh, it also has additional features to sustain and enhance these bandwidth. Uh, these uh, immense bandwidth uh, that we system affords. And also it has some advanced AI enhancement features, much like a GPU, like uh, very long vectorization and support of multiple data types, like FP6, uh, short precision arithmetic and integer operations, uh, vector operations. So collectively, you, know, you can look at this chip from 30,000 feet or 10,000 meters, I like to say the symmetric, um, that um, uh, this chip is very much like a CPU program like a CPU that can also behave both as a CPU, but also like very much like a GPU. So, uh, and this really shows in the power performance figures and also performance figures, like I said, the goal was to produce something like three times faster and uh, one third the energy efficiency. And um, we have proven that uh, across the board uh, in all applications. In fact, this slide is old. These two just sent me a new slide um, indicating even better performance bumps than this, but unfortunately it's, it was in Japanese, so I couldn't incorporate in time. But you can see this is a power performance slide, uh, but you can see that uh, across the board in all the major open source applications for HPC, um, uh, from dense linear algebra to um, uh, driving quantum, uh, quantum chemistry uh, or, um, or molecular dynamics to uh, bandwidth bound applications, seismic applications, uh, structural applications and, and uh, CFD, the chip is about three times more power efficient than a comparable top-end uh, Intel processor, and uh, it's equivalent for and equivalently for, uh, for performance. So this is packaged 
Uh, like that in a very dense configuration, water cool, there's also a commodity co uh, configuration uh, if you want just a few notes. No. Uh, but um, uh, that was a dense configuration uh, that was developed to accommodate uh, 15,976 nodes uh, that com comprise Fugaku. So this is the biggest supercomputer ever built in terms of number of nodes, and of course the fastest, uh, obviously. Uh, but it's not just the um, number of nodes or flops that's important. Uh, the, the other importance is the fact that uh, they can support multiple precision to further drive the performance, but also the fact that, uh, as you see in the very bottom of the left-hand side, it can have up to more than 150 petabytes per second of memory bandwidth, which is unprecedented in any, super, in any machine or whatever type. So this uh, performance has allowed us to uh, become number one in the June 2020 edition, not just on the top 500, which is a dense linear algebra benchmark, but a sort of across the board in various computational patterns and also the, uh, the application areas these benchmarks signify, including HPCG, which obviously is a conjugate, uh, conjugate gradient sparse linear algebra uh, benchmark, which is actually more important for HPC. Most applications are uh, much more Affinity to HPCG than, than top 500, uh, Blimpac. HPLAI, which is a mixed precision slash um, AI, especially convolutional neural network uh, proxy, in that um, you know uh, basically emulates the very low level uh, convolutional uh, patterns uh, when you do the matrix uh, form uh, computation uh, of these uh, CNN. And then Green five, uh, Graph 5, I'm sorry, Graph 500, which is basically a broad breadth of search of a graph. So it's really a big data. Uh, in core big data uh, benchmark. So we got number one across the board. Uh, and uh, in fact, for our new edition, November 2020, that was just announced yesterday, uh, we got number one again, but we have even increased our performance, especially uh, HPLI on Graph 500, because as you see in the, in the figure, we were not able to exploit all the machine the last time. So now, compared to the number two machine, uh, we have anywhere from about factor three to factor 5.5 advantage. Um, and these are machines in US and China. Uh, so basically, Fugaku is the fastest, um, not only fast machine, but also is faster, fast, uh, faster than the number two machine by several factors. And, uh, but I said, you know, this is the, Fugaku was developed with the application in mind, Applica was application first philosophy. So why is it important to become number one in the rankings? Well, of course, becoming number one in the rankings was never the target objective of development. You know, it was the applications, a variety of applications, including nine target applications from very important areas like healthcare, pharmaceutical, energy, climate, um, disaster prevention, weather, um, um, energy uh, and also manufacturing and so forth. These were the target applications that we have very explicit target goals in these domains. And these benchmarks were never the target. But on the other hand, benchmarks do represent a very, uh, you know, a certain facets of applications in particular domains or particular subsets of applications in the whole spectrum. So if Fugaku were to meet its original goal of being fast across wide variety of applications, top performance, uh, top level performance in variety, um, a variety of applications, that it would only follow that even it would do fine, excellent in all the benchmarks too. The counterpoint of this is if Fugaku had done excellent in only one or two benchmarks and did not do well in the others, then you know, we would have not have met our goal. In fact, it would have been a huge disappointment that um, if Fugaku had only been excellent and let's say Limpact. So um, the fact that we were excellent, uh, we uh, won the top accolade across the board, um, across broad variety of benchmarks with different computational patterns, different target areas, uh, different, uh, um, you know, different objectives, et cetera, was really, you know, uh, that really felt we had met our objectives. And this also is demonstrated in the software stack. So, uh, you know, a lot of new supercomputers use uh, uh, more dedicated specialized chips as the main um, uh, compute drivers. So getting this uh, convergence of um, uh, traditional simulation-based software stack, big data software stack, AI-based software stack, uh, cloud software stack is very difficult. 
Whereas with the general purpose processors, it's, it's much easier because you know if you have ARM processor or x86 or, or you know if you have any sort of popular ISA, then chances are these will run and these will run very fast, high performance. There are some few exceptions, like um, we had to do a lot of work in the AI to accelerate the frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow. But other than that, um, the these uh, software stacks merge very, um, I would say, naturally, converge very naturally, because they all run standard software. The operating system we run in Fugaku is the is Red Hat's Linux. We don't run specialized kernels. We don't run you know uh, limited software like lightweight kernels. We don't do anything like that. We just run the standard Red Hat software, a uh, Red Hat Enterprise Edition, out of the box. No new drivers, no patches, anything like that. So, you know, this allows us to really expand the utility of the machine. So it's not because it's not just hardware, it's all the software, the system software and all the tools and utilities and libraries and so forth that constitute the entire machine that allows for this generality to do to be realized. You know, we really have got to have this generalized software stack, the tool chains and people's expertise and be able to uh, port their code, queue their code, run their code, get their science and engineering done. That's really important. So software part, is really important, and uh, we really made it, I think, really made possible by adopting ARM and making it very efficient. So, you know, all the, this also goes for the ISV software that's also in preparation. And we're working with various cloud vendors to uh, uh, have the cloud uh, services uh, implemented on top of Fugaku. So Fugaku can be used as a traditional, traditional supercomputer or Fugaku can, services can be accessed through uh, cloud services. We provide just like you know, Amazon EC2. And then there will be additional cloud provide, commercial cloud providers that will utilize these services to provide added value on top of Fugaku. And also this allows for um, adoption of the Fugaku's technology uh, to other major cloud vendors. Um, for example, let's say Amazon, and using the new A chips developed like X4FX. Because if we can demonstrate its, uh, its worth in the Fugaku cloud, then it's only natural that companies like Amazon will pick it up uh, and put it and make the make it part of the infrastructure. So we're hoping that will happen. Um, about AI, um, so um, you know, you would think you know, Fugaku would be excellent in AI because on one hand, we for one thing, we did put in these uh, AI enhancement features like uh, low precision arithmetic. But also, uh, modern AI is quickly becoming an HPC and, uh, endeavor. And for that, you really need to have parallelism to massively scale in terms of parallel in terms of being a parallel computing job, just like you know your standard physics job is a parallel computing job, much more, much very very much different from what you run on the desktop, you know workstation. What you run on the supercomputer is completely different, but it has much more capable. Same thing with the deep learning. What you run on your desktop, you know training your deep learning is very different from what you can do on a supercomputer. So we're trying to make, uh, realize these capabilities. And um, fortunately, Fugaku, as, as has been demonstrated in HPLI, it's number one machine there. So, but it's, it, well, there are technical challenges. So um, just show uh, some of the team members that are, that challenge, that are undertaking the task to really scale um, the deep learning to 100,000 nodes on Fugaku which of course nobody has achieved, not even Google, Microsoft, whoever, have achieved uh, deep learning training scaling to 100,000 uh, 100, nodes. So um, it's a big tech, technical challenge. And there are many things we need to do and uh, we're working, uh, uh, Recan is working with Fujitsu to realize that. There are even papers just being presented at SC20 that's going on at the same time this week that uh, some, of, um, some of the technologies we have developed which will help us to uh, reach this plateau. So um, we already have very efficient uh, TensorFlow PyTorch implementation thanks to a lot of work by Fujitsu's, uh, Fujitsu's team. And we can show that it scales linearly across, uh, when you increase the number of nodes. And some of the early experiments have showed that um, we have seen scalability of deep learning up to something like 27,000 nodes. And uh, we can, well, and later on in the year, uh, uh, the fiscal year, you know, probably around February or uh, March, we will test scalability of the, some of the uh, base deep learning codes up to 100,000 nodes on Fugaku, which will be, of course, unprecedented. 
And it's just not just AI itself, but combination with HPC. Um, you know, there are various ways you can combine deep um, uh, AI with HPC, and I don't have time to go through all the examples. But one thing is it can really drive uh, industrial design and innovation there. Uh, there are very, uh, one thing you can create proxies of simulations. So the AI, because in some cases, if you, uh, if you train your uh, deep neural network with uh, computer results, but once you train them, if you can replicate these functions much faster, then you can quickly uh, enumerate through various parameter space. Or you can even you know, use the AI to reuse the model in an effective way. And then you can use the AI or the optimization driven thereof to really pick the right design, uh, uh, right design choice. Uh, and there are multiple design optimization you need to do. Uh, for example, um, in automobiles, uh, if you, in order to design a car, uh, you want fuel efficient design, you want safe design, you know, be resistant to wind shear, let's say, uh, in the aerodynamics. And also you want the car to look pretty and beautiful and uh, attractive to buy. So uh, it's very difficult, uh, it becomes sort of Pareto optimization, uh, but it's very difficult to say uh, which design is the best. But uh, this combination of HPC, AI, and AI will allow us to come up with designs that may not have been thinkable by humans. We can uh, put these simulation results as or as AI proxies or reduced models, they can also uh, encode human uh, knowledge or human perception of beauty of a car. Also encoded as a neural network, we can combine them and come up to a Pareto optimal, optimal result, which may not have been possible with just a uh, simple human and loop type of design philosophy. So we're very looking forward to this kind of design innovation that's hap that happens. Finally, in the last few minutes, I'll talk about COVID. Um, we're working a lot to counter COVID uh, with Fugaku early on, even before the full machine was launched, because we saw we were actually hampered by, uh, by uh, COVID-19 in the manufacturing and installation and heroics of Fujitsu and Rika and the operation team saved the day. And uh, we turned around and, this, and decided to use uh, utilize Fugaku because it's simply the most powerful machine out there. Uh, to, uh, to combat um, uh, COVID-19. And there are five uh, applications, uh, five teams. There, are, there will be a sixth team joining soon, hopefully. And uh, one facet is to look at the uh, COVID-19 virus as molecule, uh, atoms or molecules, uh, and then try to see the overall uh, characteristics or trying to find, discover drugs, or in fact, to repurpose drugs that would be effective against COVID. And also to look at uh, the other uh, effort is to um, basically have a much more microscopic view of the transmission itself, like how the aerosols and droplets would uh, would be emanated from human beings and, and how the spreads in the air and how it can you know, dissipate in the room and how it can be protected. We fear a lot of the uh, infections happening uh, in Europe, for example, is due to uh, aerosols and in an enclosed environment because it's getting cold in Europe and they, they, a lot of the European buildings are not well ventilated. So and we are trying to find countermeasures uh, that would uh, allow for mitigations of these transmissions. And also look at much more, even more macroscopic view, like how, whether things like uh, um, transmission reducing contact tracing applications would help, what percentage of um, uh, population needs to download this, or what are the impact of lockdowns? What, what if you do a, a certain type of lockdown, how does it impact the economy versus how does it protect people from getting infection? So getting a much more detailed computer mo um, simulation models of, uh, to, to analyze the effects of these lockdowns. Yeah, so um, I don't have time to go into some of those details, but um, yeah, um, uh, it's work. There are a lot of work in progress and uh, just to, one well, um, here is looking for drugs, here is looking at the masks and um, it's really helping uh, these results actually have been televised on Japanese TV quite a bit. And really has helped to educate the public. So a lot of people come to me and say, you know, Fugaku is great, but they know about point one, they know about Fugaku because all the news shows carry them. And also they can see the viruses which they cannot see or the aerosols which are invisible. But now they know how they spread through our computer simulations so they're keenly aware of what to do and what not to do, the importance of masks and the importance, and the importance of being well ventilated while being much more, less cognizant about situations where it's less dangerous like being outdoors. 
So uh, I really think has helped to mitigate the transmissions um, in, in the Japanese society. So uh, that's it, and hopefully there will be more to come from Gaku, and I'm um, looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Matsuki-san, thank you very much. Um, what a wonderful uh, description of this, uh, this new extraordinary uh, device. Um, and it's really interesting how, in just in the last few seconds, you commented on how the existence of Fugaku and, and the existence of the visual simulations that you could share with the public gives the public uh, a, more, a more appreciation for you know, the, the different attributes of COVID-19. So I think those are, those are not outcomes that I think we expect when we, we set out on, on such uh, ambitious uh, pathways that, that, that obviously your team and yourself have done, but it's, it's really encouraging to hear that. I do have a question here, uh, a few questions. Um, can we envision an A64FX CPU in the future, laptop or desktop, given that it's general purpose? Yeah, you know, that's something I've been advocating to Fujitsu for some time. You know, we mm -hmm. said, why don't we just build a workstation version? A lot of people are requesting that. Uh, there's a workstation version, there's a server, uh, and the minimum configuration there is actually two chips in a, in a standard one U server space. And I told, you know, told Fujitsu, well, just let me build a really cheap, you know, uh, inexpensive workstation version because you know, it has 32 gigabytes of memory. It's enough to do most stuff. And uh, just attach a video card and uh, you're good to go. And um, yeah, so send your request to Fujitsu and um, uh, maybe they'll comply with this version or maybe foreseeable evolution of the current chip. But it's, it's really a, uh, you know, I, when we use it, uh, it's no different from any other you know, Linux box. Just a box. People can actually compile on, on, on this machine, do self-compilation, and uh, it's, it's pretty fast there. So yeah, again, please send requests to um, Fujitsu. And maybe just one final question. Um, you, you covered quite a bit of information, and uh, this might just allow some of the folks in the audience to play catch up a little bit. What hardware features that were not in the previous uh, version, previous supercomputers, uh, what hardware features give Fugaku the edge for the types of applications that you, uh, you mentioned? Well, I think um, the principal well, it's a combination of features that allow for uh, immense bandwidth to be supported to have a very balanced machines. So we recently wrote a paper uh, that's been that's on archive now and uh, it's been submitted to a certain uh, class, uh, tier one conference that says, you know, how do we look? Uh, and also we had some papers in the past that looks at uh, various types of workloads and um, uh, far and far most, uh, a lot of these workloads are A, um, very much bandwidth bound and B, uh, even for compute bound, except for very few instances like um, for first principle shredding equation sol solver, which is a little different story, but for most, for the most part, can be done with reduced precision, mixed precision arithmetic. So um, mixed precision, combination mixed precision, but you know, uh, but primarily immense bandwidth in the memory system, but not just the memory, the, the core itself, the uh, uh, intra-chip interconnect, uh, and also the interconnect between the TOFU network and between the chips, that I think is allowing for um, significant um, uh, performance gains. Now, combine that with the uh, extreme power efficient design we had done, uh, because uh, from the onset, we had this really cra pretty crazy at the time it seemed, um, power target goals, uh, power efficiency target goals. And it was, um, again, um, very careful design to put, uh, that was done to really save power whenever possible to make the chip as um, the most power efficient. So there are a lot of controls and knobs that allow you to save power in the chips, in the chip itself, to uh, basically minimize your power depending on your workload. So I think those are the principal features that allow uh, Fugaku to excel, or the AC4FX to excel. Very good. Well, uh, Sochi, very nice to have you on our, on our um, webcast today. and. It's a tremendous uh, opportunity to hear more about this um, groundbreaking development. And so thank you very much for uh, joining us. And I might just ask you um, to press refresh on your on your browser. Uh, it sounds like we've had some problems with your video just in the last few seconds. So we, we do want you to be part of the next uh, part of the discussion. So thank you very much. With that being said, we're gonna move to our final panel of the day.
And the panel is, is called Forging a Foundation for Digital Trust with Novel ICT Systems. And of course, uh, a great dovetail from our previous session about Gaku Supercomputer. And uh, for this panel, I'd like to introduce um, our moderator. Uh, Indrajeet Ghosh received his Bachelor of Technology degree in Computer Science and Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, in 1993. He then completed his MA and his PhD in Electrical Engineering from Princeton University. Indrajeet has been working on various research areas at Fujitsu Laboratories of America in Sunnyvale, where he currently is a senior member of research staff. He has authored or co-authored more than 50 technical articles in international journals and conferences. And his research interests include various areas of verification, validation, and testing of software and hardware systems. Indradeep is also a clean energy and sustainable living enthusiast. It's my pleasure now to welcome Indradeep Ghosh. Thank you, Dean. Um, good afternoon, everyone in the Americas. And good morning and uh, good evening to people who are watching from other parts of the world. Welcome to the third and final panel of the day, Forging a Foundation for Digital Trust with Novel ICT Systems. Now, as you know, um, this panel will be actually discussing about the impact of ICT systems on the new normal. So how ICT systems are rising up to the channel, how the information and communication technology systems, as they are called, are try evolving uh, to actually give us new solutions in this new normal and what lies in the future for them. So as you all know, uh, the pandemic actually created a set of new requirements for ICT systems that the world was largely not prepared for. So if you look at this uh, small diagram, which uh, uh, envisions some new requirements from a healthcare provider point of view or maybe a hospital point of view, you will see now there are new uh, problems that arise from contact tracing. How do we do contact tracing? How do you do quarantine and self-isolation of people who are infected? How do we do screening for the infection efficiently? How do you do clinical management? And how do you do planning and tracking of all the supplies that we need? How do you know, know that medical supplies such as face masks are there for the healthcare provider when they need it. So these has put a lot of new demands on ICT systems or hardware and software systems in things like uh, inventory management, right? How to, how to manage your inventory properly so that things are with you, how to optimize your supply chains, like the time and cost of the optimization, how to optimize your transport system, like the fuel or the route they would take or what kind of vehicles you are going to use to actually transport even patients or even supplies? What kind of technology would you use for remote work or workflow management? So all these are things that ICT systems are going to actually help us resolve in the future. So uh, Fujitsu has been actually a uh, working on these ICT systems for quite a few decades now, and we have a ton of innovation going on in the laboratories. So uh, first of all, we have enterprise, we worked on enterprise systems like servers. From there, as you heard from Atsuka san we have excellent contributions in high performance computing and advanced computing, like Fugaku supercomputer. We have various kinds of uh, uh, applications that do data analytics, we do uh, various types of social problem sol solving, like uh, uh, grid management and power management in electrical grids. And now with the advent, uh, with the Moore's law actually slowly ebbing in a decade or so, we are slowly moving into this new area of domain-specific computing. And one such example is the digital annealer, which is a specialized hardware chip that actually can do optimizations on various types of processes like scheduling and allocation and so on. And we'll see in this uh, panel how actually it's helping in various problems uh, during this uh, pandemic. And finally, in the new decade, we'll actually jump into a completely new paradigm of computing, which is uh, quantum computing. And though the, it's just early days for that, Fujitsu has already started contributing and 
taking this uh, seriously. And this will be something that Fujitsu will definitely contribute to uh, for the innovations of the future. So um, for this panel, we have uh, 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 four esteemed panelists that um, uh, we have for this panel. Let me introduce you to them, uh, introduce you one by one. Our first panelist is Dr. Henry Chesbro. Dr. Chesbro, who coined the term Open Innovation, is a faculty director of Garut Center for Corporate Innovation at UC Berkeley, our School of Business. He also holds the Mary Technipont Chair in Open Innovation at Lewis University in Rome. His research focuses on technology management and innovation strategy. Previously, he was an assistant professor at the Harvard Business School, and prior to that, served as product manager and VP of marketing at Quantum Corporation, a manufacturer of data storage devices. He earned a BA in economics from Yale University, an MBA from Stanford University, and a PhD in business administration from UC Berkeley. Our second panelist is Dr. Keiichi Masua. Dr. Masua obtained his PhD from Tokyo Institute of Technology and a research fellowship of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science for Young Scientists. From 1998 to 2000 work, he worked at Mitsubishi Pharmaceuticals. He then joined Novartis Pharma Japan and received an Oncology Presidents Award in 2004. He shifted to then Novartis headquarters in Basel, Switzerland and received a Viva Award as a Novartis leading scientist in 2012. He managed and developed uh, several compounds in the field of oncology, and then he joined Peptidream in 2014, and is currently an executive vice president and board member. Our third panelist is Mike Liebold. Mike is a distinguished fellow and senior researcher in the Institute of the Future. He interprets technological underpinnings of tomorrow's world, including whole systems, data networks, and immersive media. He has been working with clients, global leaders, researchers, and public groups like DARPA and Congress, exploring futures of video and spatial computing, personal information ecosystems, and health information systems. Mike is a pioneer and veteran with decades of experience as a researcher in iconic companies like Atari, Apple, and Intel. And he is a frequent speaker and commentator on future of technologies and has published numerous papers in this area. And our fourth and final panelist is Dr. Nicholas Curtis. Dr. Curtis is a pediatric endocrinologist and social entrepreneur with a unique dedication to telehealth, uh, improving the quality of life of people living with diabetes. He currently serves as director of Project Eco-Diabetes in the time of COVID-19 at Stanford University. Prior to that, Dr. Curtis served as the first pediatric endocrinologist for the University of New Mexico, and he founded Endo Diabetes and Wellness, a medical practice specializing in diabetes and telehealth. Dr. Curtis also co-founded and serves as chairman of Ayuda, a global health volunteer organization that empowers youth to serve as agents of change for youth with diabetes. Please uh, join me in welcoming all our esteemed panelists. Now, the panel will actually proceed like this. First, I will invite all uh, the panelists one by one to actually share their vision about this issue that we are going to discuss in this panel. And then we'll have an open discussion where we'll be taking also some audience questions. So without much further ado, I actually uh, hand over the stage to Dr. Henry Chesbro to listen to what he has to say about this. Dr. Chesbro. He looks... Dr. Chesbro, if you, if you unmute your mic. Dr. Chesbro? Yeah, looks, Henry looks not on the line, I guess. Okay, so uh, maybe Dr. Masua, can you uh, start your present? Yeah, maybe just a, a move to the mic part. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Masua, please. Yeah, okay, so Hello everyone. So I'm very happy to uh, talk on my part today. So I, we are working in the drug discovery field in the peptidine. So just so, you know, I'm talking very general stuff. So 
for the drug discovery to find the final molecule to the human, normally we screen the huge number of the compound. So this case, I think uh, in the small molecule area, even the peptide we are mainly focusing now, but doesn't change. Just uh, from the huge number of the compound, you have to narrow down to the maybe it's finally one compound. So then you can see that my slide looks like this. I think uh, we have tons of uh, wet uh, experiments for the narrow down the peptide or even small molecule. And we have to analyze or mining the uh, huge number of the data set. So normally we do by wet data, but we need a huge support from the I ICT uh, solutions. This is our general situation. So question is, I think uh, for the normal rational approach for the drug design, we need uh, to understand uh, the uh, compound structure or uh, stable conformation. So in this case, I think small, in case of the small molecule, relatively easy, but uh, I can show you next slide. Uh, in the peptide, this is also problematic. And also we are facing the big issue for the, uh, the billions, trillions data set, how we can mining the data accurately. So the next two slides I can show you, it's more uh, details, the how difficult to the, uh, the narrow down the peptide drug discovery, because you can see here, in small molecule case, I think a stable structure conformation, relatively easy to uh, find, even the current available ICT solutions. But in case of the peptide, as you can see, the number is huge how we can analyze the peptide conformation by current methodology or even ICTs. I think even the Fugaku maybe takes, a, I, I don't know, a few minutes or one day or something. It's a huge number of the data set we have to analyze here. So we in actually, for the, this purpose, we initiated a huge collaboration with Fujitsu last year. So we are now using the digital arena I think uh, in the deep or the uh, show up, and also high performance computing HPC. We are now looking how we can analyze the peptide stable conformation quickly and more than the current available methodology. And this technology also can try, uh, try to apply for the, uh, the COVID 19 drug discovery. We are. So, the second one is uh, simply data mining. So in case of the small molecule field, I think uh, already many solutions is uh, commercially available and relatively high level. I think uh, it's good enough, I would say. But in case of the peptide uh, drug discovery, I think uh, so far a uh, uh, good solution is not to exist. So we are now uh, talking, uh, the looking for the good collaboration with Fujitsu to provide a nice solution for this area. So my talk is maybe finished. Okay, thank you, Dr. Matsua. That was very interesting uh, to see how the digital annealer is actually helping uh, in various kind of drug discovery and so on. And um, uh, so I will now actually ask uh, Mike Liebold to uh, give his presentation. Hello. Yes. Please go ahead, Mike. Yes. Can you see my slide? Yes. Oh, good. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I'm grateful to join you. Um, as uh, as uh, was mentioned, as Indradeep mentioned, uh, I work for the Institute for the Future, and <clears throat> I try to help our clientele or our teams understand the technical foundations of the future. Uh, so uh, my role is not to predict the future. No one can predict the future, but um, we can develop a vivid understanding of um, the future by taking a look at things that we see today. And we call these signals of the future. So today, um, uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, four major shifts uh, uh, 
Fugaku has the power to pull the future closer, and its ability has been recognized as top in the world. But I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure what happened here. Let me get back to where I was. We are going to your slide. I'm trying to get to my slide. I don't understand how, how that me. happened. Yep, there you go. Go ahead. For some reason, I'm seeing the uh, Fugaku slides here. I'm very sorry. Trying to get to my slide. Yeah, there you go. I still, my view, do I have to refresh my, yeah. my monitor, maybe? Just look at live view. You're fine. My live view shows uh, large scale public AI infrastructure. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Mike, it's Dean here. And to our audience members, just bear with us. Mike, take your time. No problem. We'll, we'll solve the problem. We've got a captive audience. And when you're, you manage to recover to your slides, we'll go through your slides. Well, uh, push to the audience. All right, can you see that? Future IT ICT systems. Selected yeah, future issues. ICT system, selected issues. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, great. My apologies. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm not a, an engineer or a biologist, but I do look at the large systems. So as we look at the large systems, we can see four, four shifts that are going to change our telework. Right now, uh, we, we believe the Institute for the Future that telework is the future. So all of the tasks that people might, um, particularly white collar workers, all of the tasks that people might conduct inside an organization um, will be done by telework. And so there's going to be some these, these four shifts in the ICT infrastructure that are going to affect the quality of um, our telework. So the first is that the user experience uh, is indeed going to shift from flat screens to the real world. Um, uh, we, we see the beginning now uh, of affordable, low-cost mixed reality, which combines both virtual re reality uh, as as a possible and probable um, work environment in the home. The first cheap um, uh, AR glasses coming from China are coming out now in the $500 range. We'll see if, if, if they're good, whether they can achieve the economies of scale. Apple, Facebook, Google all are going to introduce new ways to visualize our work experience within the coming two, three, four years. Um, we're going to see uh, an increase in the natural language interaction with personal agents like Alexa and Siri, but the problem of Alexa and Siri are not private, and they, they're, your, your experience is mine for marketing reasons or for machine learning. Um, uh, it, so um, at Stanford, the Open Virtual Assistance Laboratory, they're working on an open source, open um, privacy aware agent that can talk to other conversational agents in the future. Uh, so they, they're putting together a consortium so that you at least have one agent that will negotiate on your behalf with the commercial agents that are mining your experiences. The new application environment is going to be what um, Hal Varian from UC Berkeley describes as combinatorial. It's a giant marketplace of new experiences. So um, enterprise designers who are enterprising new tools uh, for their teams and software developers and innovators are on the right going to have a buffet of capabilities that can be combined. These are all, quote, AI 
related processes, machine learning is required for all of these, augmented reality, virtual agents, instant collaboration, decision support, proactive computing, amplified productivity, and even system and personal security. The point is that AI is, is going to take place not just in the service that you're using, but in every node of every network across the technology stack. Uh, we're going to see applied intelligence and machine learning to improve everything. So if we take a look at the left-hand kinds of tasks uh, that machines can improve perception, recognition, learning, analysis, rendering, and orchestration. So over the next decade, it's gonna be a decade of continuous improvement. And by the way, for those of you interested in hardware, and I know Fujitsu is interested in hardware, um, it's an arms race um, for general purpose CPUs, but more and more people are finding that um, uh, GPUs, uh, uh, that like NVIDIA's uh, uh, GPUs, or tensor processing units, or other new kinds of hardware architectures are optimal for high performance machine learning. So the once we get onto the network, we're going to see another change. 5G is coming, but what a lot of people don't realize about 5G is it's almost all software. Uh, the 5G base station, which is called a MEC, a multi-access edge computer, has to um, arbitrate um, all kinds of different signaling and messaging across the various uh, 5G radio channels, as well as managing network in interfaces, and increasingly hosting services for cloud service providers. Uh, it turns out for low latency applications like conversational agents, virtual reality, um, IoT security, autonomous driving, all require very, very low latency reaction with the network. And just the short hop to the edge server for 5G is just fits the latency requirements for many applications. Um, and plus a lot of the data and the compute that might take place at these edges rightfully shouldn't take place in the cloud. The best example is a video camera uh, that sees anomalies all day long and yet, I mean, sees normal behavior all day long, but only sees an anomaly rarely. So it doesn't need the flood, the network with broadband video of every single incident at that particular camera at that node. It needs to have the intelligence to recognize the anomaly and only send the anomalies upstream for the security processing. So the MEC is a new um, battle point. We see uh, among the communications companies, people uh, op working on an open standard is called open radio access networks, where uh, groups like Huawei and Ericsson are arguing and are trying to sell full technology stacks. But meanwhile, there are all kinds of um, trials and experiments going on. Um, Verizon, for example, is working with NVIDIA to put a lot of GPUs at the edge of the network to do the kind of video processing I described. Um, so there's another shift at the edge of the network, and that is in cybersecurity. Uh, because um, workers at home and work mobile workers need all of the facilities of the, of the enterprise and of the cloud services and the suppliers um, of the enterprise, um, the very, very special new kind of authentication and security is required. So the new systems called SASE, uh, Secure Access Service Edge, um, qualifies not only the, the user based on multi-factor uh, authentication, but the machine the user's on, and, um, and then provides conditional access, not just to the enterprise services you'll see in the right ring here, but all kinds of, of network services, uh, network slicing, software-defined wide area networks, cloud computing services, all handled from a single login right at the edge of the network. So naturally, this is an enormous competitive point now. Many, many of the major cloud service providers 
um, are racing to provide this kind of combined login authentication service at the edge of the network. Um, not only obvious people like Cloudflare, the uh, the enterprise firewall provider, but um, uh, IBM, VMware, Amazon, and perhaps uh, even Amazon and Apple might become your point of contact. So this implies too that all of the APIs for all of the services that connect through this zero trust network, as Google calls it zero trust, because you've got to prove your network's good and your de your device is good enough to to get the VPN to all these services. Um, this this all pushes a, a major demand on interoperability of the APIs across these multiple clouds. So this is going to be a new innovation ecosystem. Um, finally, the, one of the the final major shift is that um, there's a new kind of server of supercomputing. It's serverless computing. Um, the the difference is rather than having to use a facility or rent a facility or rent a computer by the hour or by the day, serverless computing lets you rent capabilities by the millisecond. And you can, with the proper script, using something like OpenWhisk to schedule your programs, you can fire up a million blades if you want. So this, again... And, and by the way, shut them down again in milliseconds and just be billed for milliseconds. So this is a tremendously new challenging paradigm for solutions designers to be able to apply not only machine learning and AI, but almost unlimited um, uh, cloud serverless computing company using millions of servers uh, for just milliseconds. So... Um, those are some of the, the big shifts that I see. I'm, I may have run over my seven minutes, but uh, I'm sorry for the technical issues. Uh, uh, thank you, Mike. Um, really illuminating. Uh, so uh, we actually locked Dr. Chesbro earlier, but he's back on. So I would like to invite him to actually share his thoughts on this issue. Dr. Chesbro, please. Dr. Chesbro? Can you unmute yourself, please? Okay, I think we're still having trouble with Dr. Chesbro. So then, uh, Dr. Curtis, are you here? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, could you please go ahead with your presentation? Sure. Well, thanks for inviting me to speak with you um, uh, this afternoon um, uh, or this morning or this evening, uh, wherever you may be uh, joining us uh, from. I think my slides just went backwards. Here, here. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk to you, um, take a brief time to share with you a telehealth program. Called, okay. Your camera called, is... What's that? Is your camera turned on, Dr. Curtis? Yeah, let's see. Okay. Let me... Do you see me now? Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, okay. so I'm gonna take some time to uh, share with you a telehealth program called uh, Project ECHO. Um, that's becoming even more relevant in the time of COVID that can be used as a platform to also leverage uh, ICTs. Um, we're obviously living in unprecedented times right now with COVID-19, um, and there's glaring uh, examples of racial and social injustice and health inequalities uh, during the pandemic uh, that are shedding light on examples of underlying say, uh, racial injustices, health inequalities, um, that here in the U.S. have been endemic uh, for many years and also um, in other countries as well. And I'm a diabetes uh, specialist, and diabetes is one of the most common and burdensome chronic conditions, uh, not just in the U.S., uh, but throughout many countries around the world, uh, um, particularly in LIMCs. Uh, one second, Dr. Curtis. Can you yeah. turn on your video, please? 
It's the video is, is it on? It's on on my computer. I'm not. Um... Okay. Okay, please go ahead. Okay. Um, and um, so, um, um, so diabetes and, and uh, lower uh, income middle uh, LIMCs, um, the burden of diabetes is even growing more disproportionately um, there compared to the rest of the world. Um, uh, speaking of the U.S., um, community health centers or federally qualified health centers, FQHCs, uh, not only care for some of the most uh, medically vulnerable populations with complex um, social determinants of health, but they also tend to have an increased burden of disease, as in the case uh, with diabetes, as you can see here, where the burden is double that in community health centers compared to the general population, and also where outcomes are, are more suboptimal. So from a public health perspective and population health level, these clinics um, and types of clinics um, that, tar that in the U.S. Um, are the types of clinics to target to bring new therapeutics um, and new management where patients might not have access to specialists um, like me. Um, so uh, Project ECHO stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes, and it's a globally recognized hub and spoke outreach model that was developed to reduce disparities and improve health outcomes in patients who otherwise lack um, access to routine specialty care. Uh, and the goal of ECHO is to democratize specialty knowledge, and the focus is on moving the knowledge instead of moving the patients. Um, and it was started, uh, the model was started in response to poor outcomes, lack of specialists, the supply demand mismatch, um, increased disparities of care. And, and then really the core was the lack of confidence in, in primary care providers or frontline people um, um, managing uh, complex conditions that might be beyond their, uh, their, their scope. Um, and it started in New Mexico and since um, has been expanded um, to 400 um, hubs around the world. Um, and it's, uh, its application and implementation over 70 different uh, specialties in the U.S. Uh, the opioid um, uh, pain addiction um, has really been um, um, growing exponentially here. Um, and I'll share with you what's going on with, uh, with COVID uh, now in terms of the, the application. So um, ECHO is a form of telehealth, but it differs from the traditional one-to-one -one telemedicine, uh, which um, uh, thanks to COVID is now expanding exponentially. Um, but even with the expansion of direct telemedicine, there's still not enough specialists to meet the demand for patients. So ECHO is a way to amplify um, specialty knowledge and to overcome the supply demand mismatch. Uh, the model is flexible and it's adaptable and there are four components, um, or the, the ABCDs of, uh, of the model, um, where it can be applied to any different, uh, any type of, of specialty or set setting. And that's amplification using technology to leverage scarce resources. It's best practice sharing. It's focusing on case-based learning and not just um, what best practice guidelines are, but how to implement them um, and focus on quality improvement. And, um, and lastly, monitoring um, outcomes. And so this is a, um, um, uh, an example of uh, ECHO in action. So at Stanford University, we started a um, ECHO program specifically for, for, for diabetes. Um, and so in that, you have a hub and spoke model. So the hub, an academic medical center with a team of multidisciplinary specialists. So uh, pediatric endocrinologists, adult endocrinologists, diabetes educators, behavioral health specialists, nurses, uh, pharmacists, all in one place or now with COVID, all in one Zoom room. And then you have spokes. Um, so these are community providers spread out geographically, rural to urban throughout California that care for some of the most vulnerable uh, patients who don't um, have access or don't utilize that access to, to receive routine um, specialty care. So it's those providers who are um, on, the, on the front line um, 
um, and, and lacking. And it's it's low cost. It uses the Zoom uh, platform, and so providers um, uh, can connect whether it's on their uh, their their mobile or their um, or, or, or their or their desktop. Um, and so traditional echo programs started kind of hub and spoke where there might be 30 different um, um, organizations connecting at one time and it's, it's telementoring, it's teleeducation. So maybe um, over an hour, you'll give a didactic presentation, um, and, but then the providers present cases and you give uh, feedback. And then there's ways to kind of leverage um, technology. So for me, a diabetes specialist of teaching uh, people how to get people, uh, providers uh, to get patients on the newest technology and management tools um, that they wouldn't otherwise uh, be, be aware of. And so um, the COVID effect has really kind of turned um, ECHO into a more hybrid webinar to really uh, scale and meet, um, address the urgent needs um, um, and increase reach um, in, in the time of, uh, of crisis like this. Um, and so an example of, of implementation and, and scale um, with uh, U.S. government funding um, um, ECHO programs now being expanded um, to in, within the states um, to address, um, to try to target every nursing home in the country. So, for example, at Stanford, um, uh, we just started an ECHO uh, program focused on um, nursing homes where the goal is to uh, train um, nursing homes on best practices in the time of covid over the next six, uh, 16 weeks. And so of the 1,200 or so nursing homes in California, um, we're now reaching a, a little over 800 of them uh, plus um, and sharing best practices over um, a three to four month period on a weekly basis um, and focusing on, on quality improvement. And um, um, for, for diabetes, we created a national program. Uh, diabetes is one of the highest uh, risk uh, categories for COVID complications. Um, and so we, um, there was a need for this nationally, and we created a, um, uh, a webinar series. So the, the, the model is a, a way to, to leverage uh, scarce resources and to also leverage new innovation that comes out to get it out um, to patients who might and, and providers who might not always uh, have access. So thanks so much uh, for giving the opportunity to share, and sorry about those uh, technical difficulties. Uh, thank you, Dr. Curtis. Uh, so uh, if you could just refresh your browser, that would be great uh, because we can't see your video. Uh, mm -hmm. I will now turn the mic over uh, to uh, Dr. Chesbro. Uh, he uh, uh, actually uh, had some network difficulties, but um, I hope that he will be able to kind of uh, start his uh, presentation now. Dr. Chesbro, please. Is your mic not working? Okay. So, um, so in the interest of time, since Dr. Chesbro is still having te technical difficulties, let's move on to the question answer session then. So, uh, the, my first question uh, is to uh, Dr. Masua. So, Dr. Masua, you had talked about uh, um, the digital annealer, and you have uh, talked about how you are using the digital annealer and Fujitsu's high-performance computing to actually create uh, drug discoveries um, uh, for the new normal. So, the problem with this kind of uh, architecture is that um, it's not very user-friendly, and it's uh, not easy for uh, every uh, user to actually kind of get up to speed with it quickly because the interface is a little bit clunky. So uh, how do you uh, propose to actually bridge these gaps that need to be filled when you are going to domain-specific computing in the future? Jimmy? Can you? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Okay, so it's actually a good question. So I think based on the, our experience with, uh, for example, with the collaboration, I think this is exactly happened because uh, sometimes, you know, like an ICT designer or scientist and our like a, a drug discovery scientist, 
uh, cannot talk on the same page or even the same language in the same link. So uh, first step, I think we have to find the, the best uh, uh, language, is the same language to discuss and to understand each other. This is maybe first step. If this is working well, I think uh, like uh, our client side or you know customer side can inform on which kind of stuff we want to have. So then maybe your ICT designer scientist can manage based on the, your technology. So this is exactly how we can uh, fill the gap the very you know, complicated system with uh, also our uh, drug discovery uh, system. So this is my answer. Okay, that's great. Uh, uh, Dr. Chesbro, uh, if you uh, are online now, could you uh, give a short uh, presentation about your thoughts? Well, yes, let's, let's first establish, are you able to hear me? Yes, we, I am able to hear you, yes. Uh, okay, so refreshing one's browser works wonders. Um, <laughs> so yes, uh, my, my apologies to all of you for these difficulties. With all the power of uh, Fugaku and uh, Matsuoka-san's wonderful talk, we see that maintaining a reliable internet connection is still something that needs work. Uh, and indeed, that will be one of my messages to us uh, in this presentation. So let me start by just quickly introducing open innovation. Uh, Matsuoka-san talked about using the Linux operating system and bringing with it uh, this community of developers that along with the uh, cloud providers that they're working with, this might be the most open uh, supercomputer that we've ever seen. Uh, but I'm credited with being the father of open innovation for a book you see here that I wrote 17 years ago. Uh, and in very briefly, the idea is about knowledge flows across organizational boundaries for both pecuniary and non-pecuniary reasons. Uh, when I wrote this book in 2003, I did a Google search on the term and there were very, very few links that resulted and none of them had any particular meaning. Uh, the word open and the word innovation had showed up in the same place. Uh, more recently, though, this year, I did the same search on the same search engine and got over 800 million links. So this has really become something in the last uh, 17 years. And uh, on my own link profile, if I search for people using open innovation, I got more than 700,000 people who have open innovation as part of their profile. So uh, using open innovation, I wanna talk a little bit about the pandemic. Uh, Matsuoka-san talked about repurposing drugs as one of the use cases uh, for Fugaku, and uh, it's also important uh, for open innovation. Uh, in stopping the disease, uh, this is based on a paper I wrote earlier this year that I'm happy to share with anyone who's interested uh, the core idea is in a pandemic, when things are expanding exponentially, speed is really critical. Uh, cost and capacity, other things still matter, but speed is the utmost importance. And this is an area where open innovation can really contribute because in these collaborations, these knowledge flows across organizational boundaries, we can start in the middle rather than at the beginning of a collaboration. And indeed, most of the vaccines under development now are repurposed from other uses, other indications. And there is also uh, a repurposing and user inventing going on in the surrounding technologies for managing COVID as well. Uh, to be more specific uh, within the vaccine race, uh, the old model of innovation was something of a marathon where the journey from the laboratory to the market took place under one roof in one organization. And all three of the candidates that are putting out news this week about their clinical trial results, which are very encouraging, um, I'm showing you here Pfizer and BioNTech, but also J&J &J and Moderna and AstraZeneca with Oxford University, all of these are collaborations that you can think of as a relay race that has replaced the marathon 
of one organization going from the lab to the market on its own to a relay race where uh, innovation work and the baton being passed to other partners creates a, a relay race uh, instead. Uh, the next part of this is we have to start the economic recovery. Uh, and open innovation has a role to play here as well. Here, it's the knowledge flows from the inside going out to the surrounding environment. Uh, and the idea is that we invest small amounts of money to probe for new market opportunities. Uh, and the same amount of capital can be used to create more shots on goal that will generate initial feedback that you can think of as weak signals that can then be further explored and then amplified to point the way forward. Uh, and indeed, as we come out of the pandemic in 2021, it's clear that we're not going to go back to where we were before, uh, but indeed we are going to go forward. So uh, Michael Liebhold was talking about working from home becoming part of our work processes going forward, uh, that requires this digital transformation that the pandemic has really forced upon us. And indeed, those organizations that have maintained a robust ICT uh, infrastructure are much better positioned going forward, coming out of the pandemic. And indeed, when the virus does reoccur, and sadly, we're already seeing this recurring in both the US and Europe, the key to managing this is to maintain a robust infrastructure. That means working from home has to become something that is strongly supported by the infrastructure. The workflows that are developed and managed by the organization uh, have to be increasingly digital and we should not restrict this to our own organization, but to our partners, our suppliers, our customers, those of us in the surrounding ecosystem, all of this is going to require uh, ICT investment uh, and ICT innovation as we go forward. So those are some thoughts, Indradeep. My apologies again to you and our audience, uh, but I'm glad to be with you now. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chesbro. That was very interesting. Uh, so I had a question uh, regarding that open innovation uh, paradigm. So uh, it does have a synergistic effect through collaboration, but on the other hand, if you have closed innovation, then possibility of competition is there to speed up the innovation. So what do you think could be a good strategy and in what places do, should there be open innovation as opposed to closed innovation? Yes, Indradeep, I think I interpret your question to be where to be open and where to be more closed. Right. And my short answer is anytime you want to create more value in the surrounding environment, openness is fantastic. But when you want to capture a piece of that value for yourself, then you're going to need some way, some mechanism to capture some of that for yourself. And those elements might be the things that you don't share as much as the ones that create value in the surrounding environment. OK. okay. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Chesbro. Uh, I had a question for uh, Dr. Curtis uh, regarding the telehealth uh, paradigm that uh, he was talking about. So in the new normal, uh, the telehealth ICT systems are becoming increasingly powerful tools for monitoring patient health. However, the technology can be costly and difficult to install for a wide population. <laughs> so how do you think developing nations without a lot of resources can take advantage of telehealth technologies quickly? Yeah, so I, um, I think, you know, speaking for, from diabetes as an example, um, as um, one of the most prevalent chronic diseases and largest burden in LMICs, um, I think there's several factors. Um, I think one is scale, um, another is open source, um, and then also leveraging existing technologies for, for DIY. Um, and I think one, one example in, in diabetes is the the... Um, blood finger stick glucose and many of you um, probably have fa family members who use where those used to cost um, a, a dollar a day 
uh, a dollar each strip and up to six or ten dollars a day and asking someone to spend that much money um, and now with a continuous glucose monitor attack, you can get 288 uh, uh, readings um, uh, for about sixty dollars a, a month right now um, and so um, uh, and being able to scale some of these technologies to lower the, the, the cost um, uh, will be a great way to start okay uh, thank you, Dr. Curtis. Um, we have just amount of time for one last audience question. So I would ask uh, this to Dr. Masua. So the question is that, uh, do you think that uh, this collaboration that we have with Fujitsu is kind of a nice open innovation uh, for uh, drug discovery? Yeah, I think so. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I think, of course, so far it's like a close, uh, you know, innovation because of, and between the Fujitsu and the Pepsidolin. But uh, our final goal is, you know, after the many nice, you know, ICT solution established, I think we want to, let's say, publish or just to, you know, move forward to the other maybe customer to use and accelerate any type of drug, drug discovery in the world. So this is final goal. Okay. Thank you, all the panelists. That was a very accelerating panel. We had some technical difficulties. I think we finally could put everything together properly. And so I'd uh, uh, basically ask uh, Dean to take over from here so that uh, we can get to the closing remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, well, it wouldn't, wouldn't be a, uh, a large webcast type event without some technical difficulties. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think all of us uh, are really exercising our multitasking skills. So uh, my congratulations to the panel for, for making your way through the, uh, the difficulties. That was uh, nevertheless an excellent discussion, and thanks very much. Um, we've got one last speaker of the day, but uh, this will be my last opportunity to speak to everybody. So I wanted to just express my sincere appreciation. It's been a privilege. Uh, to be part of this event today. Uh, thank you to my colleagues at Fujitsu Labs for giving me the opportunity to play a role, an important role in this event. Arigato gozaimasu. And uh, thank you to all of you uh, that have been joining us for the balance of the day. Uh, we've had a number of great discussions regarding the impact of, of our, our advancing technologies on digital trust and more importantly, most importantly, on our ability to actually battle this pandemic. We're in it together. And it's great to see um, advanced innovation experts from all around the world uh, coming together today for this uh, very profound discussion. Uh, now, uh, it's my privilege to introduce our, our final speaker of the day who will provide our, our closing remarks. Yoichi Koenagi is the CEO of Fujitsu Laboratories of America, where he leads the team of exceptional talents to create innovative real-world technologies in a wide range of industries. He has extensive experience in research and development of high-performance computing technology in both Japan and the United States, including quantum-inspired computer architecture and high-speed interconnect technology for parallel computer systems. In fact, he led Fujitsu Labs' efforts in developing Fujitsu's digital annealer, quantum-inspired computing technology, designed very deliberately to rapidly solve some of the combinatorial optimization problems that we heard about earlier. In 2016, he was awarded with a commendation for science and technology by the Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology in Japan in recognition of his achievement uh, in high-speed data transmission technologies. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Yoichi Koyanagi. Koyanagi-san, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very, very well. Okay. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yoichi Koyanagi of Fujitsu Laboratories of America. Thank you very much for participating in Fujitsu Laboratories Advanced Technology Symposium 2020 today. Although this year's event was online, more than 500 people joined us from all over the world, and we had a very exciting discussions on the theme of digital trust, a key for sustainability in the new normal. In the first session, uh, we focused on digital trust and privacy. We heard how mathematical proof can build trust, statistical model can manage risk, and cryptography can protect privacy, such as for COVID contact tracing. In the second session, the expectations and challenges of AI 
in the context of digital trust were discussed. AI can be more trustworthy if we set humans' objectives clearly and design AI to achieve those goals. AI should help us as our teammate, not control us. In this final session, we identified various ICT technologies and applications that will enable a trusted and sustainable society in the future. Actually, I was working on the high-speed internet technology for supercomputers and had an opportunity to work on R&D with Dr. Masuka. I was so excited to see that the state-of-the-art ICT technology can solve so many social challenges which will arise in the new normal. Fugaku's advancement and the panel discussion showed that we need to consistently innovate and push the boundary to deal with the unknown future. Again, please join me in thanking all the speakers today. I hope this event will inspire you and trigger new ideas and collaborations. Fujitsu Laboratories will continue on our journey to solve unknown new challenges with the goal of achieving a trusted society through innovative technologies. And I hope you will join us in this journey. Thank you and see you at our next event.